Hi, my name is Mike Scott, Industrial Product Manager for the Modal Shop, and in today's video, we're going to test the vibration instrumentation that's part of a GE LM2500 or LM6000 gas turbine with our portable vibration calibrator. And the system starts with big differential charge accelerometers like this one, which are then routed to a, an interface module where the output can be in uh, units of velocity or G's, most commonly velocity. So in today's video, we are going to do two linearity tests, a frequency response test and a frequency response test for the accelerometer by itself. Now why are we going to do that? Well, these accelerometers and the system have a broadband frequency response of 25 hertz to 350 hertz, but vibration issues primarily occur at one times rotor speed. Now, there's two parts of the gas turbine and compressor. There's the low pressure side and the high pressure side. On the low pressure side, the rotor runs at 60 hertz or 3600 CPM. On the high pressure side, the rotor runs at 170 hertz or 10,200 CPM. So the vibration condition monitoring system is designed to isolate those two speeds and provide alert and vibration shutdown alarms at those speeds. So again, in today's video, we're going to test the linearity of the system at the low pressure speed of 60 hertz, the high pressure speed of 170 hertz. We're going to ch check the broadband frequency response and make sure that our filtering occurs at 25 and 350 hertz like we'd like. And finally, we're going to check this transducer here to make sure that its frequency response is within specification in the units of picocoulombs per G. Now, before we get started, I know that sounds like a lot of work, but before we get started, I want to show you this, okay? This is a very heavy transducer, and this is just a portable vibration shaker table. There are more powerful, more robust shakers offered by the modal shop. They're not as portable as this unit. So, before you get start started mounting this transducer, hold it out in your hand like this, and you feel the force of the integral hardline armored cable and connector trying to pull your hand down like this in the force of gravity. You can feel that force. Now imagine that force applied to the portable shaker table. It's going to cause transverse motion and it's going to cause a lot of strain in the shaker table. But what I like to do when testing these transducers is I bend the integral cable around the sensor under test, now hold it out in your hand, and you can feel the balance there. I have an equal amount of cable distributed, an equal amount of weight distributed around the transducer, and I don't feel nearly as much force. Actually, I have a little force going this way because I bent it a bit too far. That's not terribly important. The important thing is to take the strain off the shaker table, and you'll get much better test results by bending the cable around the transducer um, when you mount it to the shaker table. So the first step in our process is to mount the uh, transducer. So let's get started. So the first step of the calibration process is to apply a little silicone grease to the top of the shaker. Not terribly important here because we're only going to go to 350 hertz, but it's good to get in the habit of applying silicone grease, especially for high frequency response. This mounting pad fits the bolt pattern of the um, high temperature differential charge accelerometer. There are two mounting pads that are supplied with each calibrator. Uh, both have a bolt pattern that fits this transducer. One is built for um, M6 mounting bolts and the other is built for quarter 28 so you can use either one. The pads are etched to indicate which thread is being used. Be sure to sh secure the shaker with a supplied mounting wrench before tightening this pad. Hand tight is good. You don't have to get your entire forearm into it. Next step is to mount the transducer onto the pad. So we're going to line it up, drop a bolt through, Go ahead and tighten this on with your fingers. Okay. So there are four bolts. 
I like to tighten them on with my fingers first. And you can do this like you're putting on a tire as well. You could go diagonal if you want. At, at this point, I'm pretty good at doing them one at a time. Um, whatever you prefer. Now, I know the procedure when installing this sensor on the gas turbine says to apply 70 inch-pounds of torque. You don't need to do that when calibrating. You can just, again, apply enough torque to the bolt. Finger tight. In fact, I could have went a little further there. Again, this is, this is kind of hand wrist tight, if you will, not forearm tight. Okay? And that helps protect the shaker. If you can make it tighter, you're going to start to drag the shaker around, and uh, using the supplied mounting wrench will be very important. So that's a, good, that's a good amount of torque for calibration testing. And our weight is evenly distributed around the sensor under test. Now that we have the accelerometer mounted, we need to connect the black cable to the two-pin connector on the end of the integral armored cable. So we align the keyway, and it snaps in place like that. You heard the snap, maybe. And then give it a good amount of force to press it down. And it does take quite a bit of twisting to get that connector seated, and it clicks as you twist, and you're done. We have two Bentley Nevada 86517 uh, vibration signal conditioning interface modules here. I'm using the one on the left, and the output of the accelerometer connects to the top of the unit. Then along the uh, terminal strip, there's a velocity output, 100 millivolts per inch per second and uh, the output of that. So I've connected a couple of spade lugs to a BNC female, and then uh, I'll just use a BNC male to male cable to connect that to the portable vibration calibrator. Um, the 86517 runs off of negative 24 volts DC, which is easy to find. I mean, it, it's probably already powered. If you do need power, um, we offer model 9100 PSO2 shown at the bottom of the screen here. Uh, this is a 24 volt power supply that plugs into the USB port on top of the shaker table uh, to acquire its power and it will power the uh, 86517 with negative 24 volts DC. And then we connect the other side of the BNC from the velocity output to the test sensor input on the shaker table. Our first test is going to be the linearity of the system at the low pressure running speed of 60 hertz or 3600 cycles per minute. So I've already created an automated test for this. I called it low pressure linearity, loaded it to the calibrator, and this will be a linearity test at 60 hertz from 0.25 all the way to the maximum vibration level at this speed for this payload, which is 2.75 inches per second peak. And that will take us through the alert and alarm levels on the system as well. So if we had this connected to the monitoring system, we could also confirm that the system correctly identified uh, the vibration faults at the alert and alarm threshold. You see on the screen every test point says pass. That's because I set an accuracy of 5% per the specification for the 86517 interface module. So I'm looking for a 100 millivolt per inch per second output at each test point and that output needs to stay within 5% of 100 millivolts per inch per second at every point. And you can see even before we show you the linearity certificate that the system is very linear as I'm getting a consistent 103 millivolts per inch per second at every test point. 
what I'm looking for as I click the button is for the known amplitude to settle in on my target, in this case 2.75. And once it settles pretty close, I'm going to go ahead and take that snapshot of the vibration data. And that's the completion of our test. By hitting next and save here, I have that test stored to the internal memory of the calibrator as my ninth record. Next up, I'm going to do that same test at a higher speed. So I'm going to test the high pressure rotor speed for linearity. So I loaded my high pressure test, high pressure rotor speed test at 170 hertz. Now at this speed, we can only get to one inch per second or just short of it. Again, my accuracy is 5%, so I'm looking for 100 millivolts per inch per second, plus or minus 5%. And I'm not going to be able to get to the alert alarm thresholds in this test because of the payload and the speed. It's just too much for a portable shaker. Bigger shaker can certainly do it. But I can get to one inch per second, and when I create the certificate, I will validate that I have linearity at 170 hertz, which is 10,200 cycles per minute. And if you prefer, the shaker can be uh, scaled in cycles per minute, so that I like hertz myself, but this display can say cycles per minute. The last test that I want to do is the broadband frequency response test which is another Cal route that I program. Those are the, what we call the pre-programmed tests. So I called it broadband frequency. I'm going to activate that test. And what we'll, we will test at 0.25 inches per second peak, which is a realistic and achievable amplitude. And we're going to check the uh, flatness of the response through the center of the frequency band and we're going to check the roll off. And here at 25 Hertz, that's our uh, 3dB roll off corner frequency. So I want to see this type of output here of only 71. That means my roll off is correct. It's starting to filter the signal out at 25 Hertz. So I have that set up to pass because the signal needs to be uh, above 63 millivolts per inch per second at this speed to pass calibration. Now, until I get close to my high frequency roll-off point, you're going to see a very flat response. At 60 hertz, I had 103. At 100 hertz, I have 103, roughly. 120 hertz, again, 102, 103 see a very flat response through the middle of the pass band and then as we approach the high frequencies we're going to reach that 3 dB corner frequency at 350 Hertz so here at 300 Hertz I expect to see that signal rolling off by at least 10 percent and that's what I'm getting I'm getting 93 millivolts per inch per second so I set up the accuracy for that to pass. And then finally, this is where I want to see at least a, a I want to see about a 3 dB roll off or a 30% roll off. And that's what I'm getting here at 350 Hertz. So again, that passes. So by performing that check, we can see that we have a very flat response through the middle of the pass band and our roll off at uh, the corner frequencies is working correctly. To test the accelerometer by itself, ideally I would have a two socket mill cable to flying leads that I could connect to the charge input. I don't have the mating connector for this particular sensor's connector, so I'm going to use alligator clips and clip directly to the pins inside the cylinder because the cylinder is actually big enough for me to get these alligator clips inside of it. The other side of those alligator clips are connected to a BNC female. So I can use a BNC male cable 
to connect to my BNC female and the other side of my BNC to male cable goes to the charge input port right here on the calibrator and then we flip the charge on off dial to on. Now that we have connected the accelerometer to the charge input and toggled the charge on off dial to on, we can test the accelerometer by itself by loading another test that I've programmed into the calibrator specifically for the 6240 M49 to perform a frequency response sweep at 1G peak from 20 hertz to 350 hertz. We want 50 picocoulombs per G. That's the measurement we're getting now. And this is the nominal uh, for the um, reference, uh, reference sensitivity, uh, reference frequency, excuse me, for this accelerometer of 100 hertz. Output is within 5%. So I pass at that point. At 350 hertz, we wait for our measurement to settle. And again, we pass. 300 hertz, let it settle, pass. At the rest of these test points, we want to be within plus or minus 5% of the sensitivity at reference frequency. 150 hertz, pass. 50 hertz, pass. 20 hertz, a little bit elevated, but we pass. Save the record of the memory, and we're all set. Okay, now that we have performed our linearity test for the low pressure rotor, high pressure rotor, tested the frequency response of the uh, vibration transmitter module and tested the frequency response of the accelerometer itself, it's time to create our calibration certificates. So on the USB supplied with the portable vibration calibrator, we have the portable uh, vibration calibrator report generation workbook, which is a Microsoft Excel macro enabled file. This runs on any computer that has Microsoft Excel. There is no additional software to download. Okay, let's take a look at our linearity certificate for the low pressure rotor. So to do so, we click uh, linearity data and we're going to import the data from the USB. So I have exported the calibration records from the, uh, the calibrator to the USB. They appear in this Cal Records underscore PVC folder, sorted by date. And I cheated a little and I added a, a few descriptors to make these easy for me to find. Um, if I were doing this for real, I would add this in the uh, serial number entry screen when creating the file if I had to, to find specific files in, in a big list like this. So low pressure linearity is right here. And I can just click uh, view certificate and you can see I've got the interface module 86517 right there as my model number. I could do this as a series, you know, 6240 M49 coupled with the interface module 86517 or whatever it is. Um, you can enter the serial numbers of course. Manufacturer is um, in Devco and Bentley Nevada. Looks like those are the two manufacturers there. But in any, in any event, this is uh, not terribly important for the purpose of this video. You can customize this certificate any way you'd like or enter any data that you would like up here. That's the main takeaway. You see the overall sensitivity here, the test frequency of 60 Hertz, linearity, maximum nonlinearity, I should say of 0.1. So this was a very linear test. Here's my plot and the raw data appears here. I can put as found as left intolerance, sign my name of course, and then the date and time appears at the bottom. Let's take a look at the linearity test for our uh, high pressure rotor. 
which is right here. Now you remember on this test, I could not test as many points as the low pressure because of the speed being 170 hertz with the payload that we had on the portable calibrator. Um, we could only generate uh, just shy of one inch per second peak, 0.997. But uh, we still got a very linear result. Uh, that was the best we could do at this particular speed, given the limitations of the portable calibrator and the payload involved. And again, I can type anything I'd like in most of these cells. I cannot type over the data cells. That's the only part that you can't type over. And of course, the date and the time is at the bottom of the certificate. If I want to create a, a creating a PDF is a good way to save it. That way the data is locked in place. So of course you can just choose to print to PDF or save as a PDF, you know, whatever, whatever method you prefer within Microsoft Excel. Okay, let's take a look at the frequency response output of the vibration transmitter itself, the um, interface module, I should say. So for that, I click on frequency data. So again, the previous tests I've been using the lin data tab for a linearity test. Now I'm going to create a plot that shows the frequency response of the 86517. And that's right here. And then I just hit view certificate. So this line is going to look a little ugly because we this is the roll off of the device. I, I think uh, the data is fantastic. The line doesn't look great because of the roll off. But this is exactly what the product is designed to do. The corner frequencies are at 25 and 350 hertz, and we're seeing that uh, that roll off there um, manifest itself in the deviation from the output at the center frequency of 100 hertz. And we can we can customize that however we'd like, but um, uh, it shows that the the data is rolling off like we want it to. It shows the overall sensitivity of about 103 millivolts per inch per second and a test level of 0.25. And of course we have the date and time at the bottom. If we want to make the line look a little prettier or at least make the graph look prettier, we can always do something like this, change our grid line and make it look real pretty. But I didn't change the data at all. I just made it look prettier by, by lifting the plot, sort of lifting the plot off the bottom there by by changing the, uh, the deviation to, uh, plot in the y-axis. Simple Microsoft Excel type of stuff. And then finally, let's take a look at the accelerometer itself. So if I go back to frequency data, import data from file, I'm going to grab the 6240M49, sorry, a little confused there. Forgot, forgot the four when I typed that in. So it's good learning experience. 6240M49 was the actual transducer. I confused myself for a moment. Okay, so the plot, obviously it doesn't look good, but take a look at our deviation. Our sensor tested fantastic. So the maximum deviation that we had was only 4.8%. That's within the tolerance of plus or minus 5%. And all of our other deviations were really tight to the sensitivity at reference, uh, which was uh, 100 hertz. And the sensitivity there was 51.22 picocoulombs per G. So um, all I would do here for this certificate is, again, just change this axis so that maybe we'll make it, instead of being plus or minus 5, we'll, we'll move it out a little bit change our grid line, and then we get a much flatter line. Again, I didn't change the data at all. I just changed how it's presented in the certificate to make it look a little nicer, but this sensor passed calibration at all test points. I can type as found as left intolerance, sign my name, and the date and time is at the bottom right of the calibration certificate. And those are the cal how to create the calibration certificates for linearity and frequency response. By testing the linearity of our vibration condition monitoring system at the critical frequencies of interest for low pressure and high pressure, 
as well as testing the overall uh, frequency band of the system from 25 hertz to 350 hertz, plus the output of the differential high temperature differential charge accelerometer itself, we can be ensured that our vibration monitoring system is working correctly. Now throughout this video, you've seen me run calibration routes or pre-programmed semi-automated step sign tests with a pass-fail notification. That helps you shorten your test time so that you don't have to use the shaker manually turning the dials. This is not the video to learn how to program those tests, but I'm sure that my friend Derek is going to insert those videos somewhere over here or maybe over here. Anyway, if you want to learn how to program those calibration routes that we showed in this video, please click on our other videos and I invite you to check out our YouTube page and our video vault on our website for more fun videos about how to test and troubleshoot vibration instrumentation. Thanks again for watching.